right. Good morning, everybody. Everybody is woken up. You've already had your first, first couple of coffees. My name is Patrick Pichette. Uh, you heard it. I. What am I famous for? At home, I'm famous for my crepe. I do amazing crepes for breakfast. But in the real world, I'm more famous for having actually been the CFO at Google. I ran a bunch of tech companies. I was the chairman of Twitter. I happened to be on the committee that actually sold it to him for 44 billion. So if you want to smile on your face, you start a day. I saw the guy who actually sold it to Elon. But we're here to actually talk about this guy, speaking of consequential companies, and um, an amazing story about product market fit and impact. So, Emil, I'll let you introduce yourself. Awesome. Give fantastic. us your life in 30 seconds or less, and then we'll My get My life going. in 30 seconds. Yeah, fantastic to be here. Actually, so I'm, I'm Swedish by background, but I've never been to Slush. And um, I moved to the Valley uh, before Slush happened. And then I heard this story about some crazy Finns wanting to get all of Europe to get to Helsinki in November. And as a Swede, I'm like, that is never going to happen. <laughs> never, ever going to happen. Uh, but then I kind of saw from afar this thing turn into what it's now become. And I was like, this is, this is amazing, right? It's got to be like one of the best conferences in the world, truly, to get people to, to power through the, the mud and the slush to get to Finland in November. What are you talking about? I mean, I was so happy as a Canadian to see snow last night when I got in. It was like, yeah, I feel like at home. This is a wonderful place, obviously. Yeah, so by way of background, I started a company called Neo4j. Um, and so we're a, a new type of database company. Uh, and we were born actually 15 years ago, so new within, within air quotes. But the backdrop, of course, back then was decades and decades, four or five decades of one database paradigm ruling everything. That was the relational database or the, the tabular database that stores information in rows and columns. And we were inspired to build something that was a little bit different. We looked at the world, which was highly complex, always changing, ever evolving, and trying to fit that worldview into square and static tables just felt like a lot of friction and very wrong. And so ultimately we were inspired by the human brain. And many of you here, probably everyone knows that the human brain consists of neurons that connects to other neurons through synapses, which builds up a network. In mathematics, a synonym of networks is graph, right? So when Mark Zuckerberg talks about the social graph, right, that's the social network. And so we called it a graph database. And we figured if you work with information in, in this way, that'll be a much better fit for modern applications. Fast forward to today, and we are 800-ish people. Uh, we just announced yesterday that we crossed $200 million in revenue. So feel really good about that and been at it for, for 15 years now. And I think there's at least 15 or 20 more years of, of, of glory ahead of us. So that's Neo4j and MLA from in a nutshell. So I think it's worth, in the next kind of 20 minutes, what I'd like to do is do a bit of walk through history. Everybody thinks, like if you're a startup, if you're thinking of your impact, the fundamental issue, as you all know, if you get your first kind of checks, your seed round, your pre-A round, it's all about product market fit, right? At the end of the day is, you have a mouse trap that you're trying to build, and will it catch mice? And I just love to hear the journey. And let's start at the very beginning. It's not obvious when you know, the whole world thinks in tables. How do you actually change mindsets? How do you get product market fit? And how did you actually kind of hit it? When did you know, hey, I think it works? So maybe a bit of the story there. Let's take a couple of minutes, hear that story. Yeah. It's a, it's a very deep question, obviously, and it's hard to summarize in a couple of minutes, which is ultimately several years of blood, sweat, and tears, right, in, in making it happen. But I think when I think through kind of product market fit from my perspective, like the fundamental aspects of it, I think is very clear, I think, to all of us, which is ultimately it's customer empathy. And 
you know, I'm on stage a lot getting asked questions like, what advice would you give to younger entrepreneurs, right? And my first advice is always, like, don't listen to advice. Because <laughs> everything is so situational always, and people tend to over-extrapolate from their own experience, right? And I'm sure I do that as well. But maybe the number one thing that, that I see young founders do, or maybe that they don't do enough, is there's no way you can spend too much time with customers. Understanding, getting that deep customer empathy, like when you are in that space, it feels like your world is spinning sometimes. Sometimes, wait, I mean, yeah, wait. yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. This will be weird on the YouTube <laughs> clip. Like, why did he say that? <laughs> Should we start walking that way? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so we can stay with everyone. But, but getting that deep customer empathy is probably the number one thing. And for us, that was very easy, actually, because we built it for ourselves. So I, in my first startup that I didn't found, but I was the CTO of that startup, we were building very complex you know, enterprise content management systems, which dealt with a lot of very deep, complex data. And we tried to squeeze that into these tables. And that just didn't work very well, right? And we you know, looked around a lot. We Alta vista around. We Yahoo'd around. <laughs> you like host around. You like us around. And, the young founders have no idea what we're talking about, but we're talking about pre-Google search engines. Um, <laughs> but we couldn't find another type of database that worked the way that we wanted it to work. And then ultimately, one day, we just said, you know, screw it, let's just build it. Or to be honest, we said, fuck it, let's just build <laughs> it. Just build like, it. how hard can it be, right? <laughs> It turns out 15 years later, it was it's pretty hard pretty to hard. A, build the technology. Like building a fully asset transactional database, there are only a very small handful of companies, less than 10 companies, that have been able to do that at scale. Yeah. Right? And we're, we're one of them. Right? Now, now we know we're one of them, but setting out to do that from a technology perspective, and then actually taking databases to market is really, really hard. Right? And so it's like this compound problem of like deep, hard technical problem, but also like a really deep go-to-market problem, right? But the, the ability to build for ourselves was huge in all this. This comes back to like the customer empathy thing, right? Well, if you are the customer, you will have empathy for the customer. In fact, I, I think the definition of empathy is being able to perceive what someone it. else is perceiving, right? <laughs> so, like, you know, so you're kind of hacking your way into customer empathy by building for yourself. So I think that was probably the, the first one. And then I think your second question was, how did we know that we got product market fit? And the reality of it is that we didn't. It was never clear. People talk about product market fit as if it's a binary thing, right? And it's not. It's a very, like, there's multiple degrees within it. And there's actually a number of new frameworks these days that we can get back to maybe towards the end that I think has a more sophisticated view of what product market fit actually is that end up being really valuable. Um, but there was never really clear to us, only in hindsight. And I think the, the, like probably the clearest signal to me was when I personally started spending more time on non-product things. Like in the early days, it was like, okay, is the product delivering value? What aspects of the pro product do people actually use? What are the key trigger points where people go from, huh, maybe I'll check it out, to I'm going to start using it, right? That's what I thought about a lot in the early days. Then all of a sudden, I found myself, what is the DNA of a salesperson at Neo4j? What kind of marketing hire should I do? Should I hire a VP marketing or a marketing manager? But then you know you've got product market fit. Exactly. That's when it's like, okay, the product is no longer the key constraint. Other things are the key constraint. But it was never clear until kind of in hindsight when I kind of looked at my calendar and realized I don't spend all my time on the product anymore. So, in, so then let's go through history. You get your first million of sales. You get your second million of sales. You get a third million. It's like, wow, this thing is working, right? Yeah. So now you're like, oh, I need a sales force. I need... And then, whether you like it or not, technology is just this massive treadmill. And you're five or six or seven years in, and then change always happens. So then you need to reset all your product market fit all over again. So tell me about when does that happen? When do you realize it? And it's comfortable to be in your own old shoes, right? As a founder, 
you got to go to be a founder again. Like, tell me about that story. Yeah. So one of the things that tends to happen on stages like this is that people talk about the story that I just talked about, which is the early days. It was glorious. It was hard. But we persevered and we were successful. And look at how successful we are, right? You know, all that kind of stuff, right? And that ends up being true. That's true of what happened for us. But there's also a ton of failure. So let me talk about a story of failure. When we tried to find product market fit, but we failed. So we are, I don't know, five, six, seven years into it. We've built a transactional database. What does that mean? That means there's a developer out there. They want to build an application. They want to choose a backend for that application, right? So this is what Oracle built. This is what MySQL built, what Mongo built, what Postgres built, right? Yeah. It's not what Snowflake is. That's an analytical database. It's a little bit different, right? But it's a transactional database. So what we started seeing after a while, when we went to our own events, to our meetups, to our conferences, is I, I always start to usually ask the question at the beginning of talks like that. I ask, who in here is a, an, a developer, right? Who in here is a data scientist? And by the way, the modern way of asking that is, who in here identifies as a developer? <laughs> who in here identifies as a data scientist, right? And what we started seeing is that there was like this surge of data scientists in the room. And we'd never built the product for data scientists. That's not for it. Exactly. It was for developers initially. So all of a sudden, we started seeing like data scientists that just got so much value from being able to analyze relationships in data and use that not to build applications, but to build machine learning models. Right? And it only took us like six months or something like that, or that just hitting us in the face when we realized, OK, there's a real product opportunity here. Because our product isn't optimized for that persona. But despite that, they knock still, at the door. they're knocking at the door. So it is like this feeling of market pull, right? Where the market is pulling this new product out, out of us, right? And so we went all in on that. We said, OK, awesome. Let's go first principles, tap into our founder mode, kind of early stage instincts. Let's deeply understand this persona, understand their universe. We felt the world spinning again, right, in a very, very good way. On a regular right? basis, it does. Exactly. And we started building out this product. We called it GDS, Graph Data Science. And it was amazing. It got so much traction. It was growing so fast that after a while, it started eclipsing the growth rate of the traditional product, right? You could start squinting, and you could see that over time, we'd become more of a data science-centric company than a transactional kind of application developer build company, right? So that started happening. We leaned in, and bam, we hit a wall. So what ended up happening was tons of data scientists adopted us. They paid for it. Yep. The revenue was growing. This is ju you, ju you were on the, you were yep. either getting onto the board or no, 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 like very exactly. early. No, no, it was exactly. And it was growing like that. Patrick, I got this thing. It's growing. It's amazing. Like, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's exactly, right? Yeah, and right. And then you start, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> and then first year came up, and the churn was very, very deep. It was like 50% or like some shocking numbers. And remember, we grew up as a database company. So we basically, churn is like, once you're embedded as a database in an application, it's hard surgery to take it out, right? So churn is not something that we're used to. But that really started happening. And so we thought we had product market fit. But ultimately, in the end, you have to have that throughout the entire customer journey. But well, at the same time, failure. there was a key learning in it. Because it was also the realization that the people that had applications on-prem we're now using much larger data sets, which are in the cloud. And we got the benefit of sniffing what the future looked like at the same time, right? That's exactly right. So what ended up happening in the end was that product was still really valuable. When we went out in kind of first principles, we talked to users. It was really valuable. But there was a split, which is if I use the database in conjunction with this data science library, it was amazing. It delivered value high retention, people didn't churn, in fact, they expanded. But if I adopted it in isolation, it turned out that data scientists were not good at putting that in production. Right? They didn't have that skill set. Yeah. But if it was attached to a database, it was very easy. 
So we realized that this thing that we thought of as a, a standalone product was very valuable, but it was valuable as an add-on product or as a feature of the database. And if, when I look at the product portfolio today, it's one of the most valuable parts of our product portfolio. I'm super happy that we did the investment, but it failed as a standalone product. Right, so that's, that's a little bit the, the nuance. And then there's like a tail end of the story, by the way, is that, and this is one of the conversations that we had in the boardroom, kind of when we, when we told this story, then Patrick and the board members were like, okay, that's great, but how many people do we have working on GDS? And it was like, I don't know, 30 people or something like that. Okay, if it's still valuable, but more like a feature, how can we find a new home for them? Fast forward to today, and we've now announced a Snowflake integration where Neo4j is becoming the graph layer on top of Snowflake. So if you have all your data in Snowflake, but you want to do graph anal analytics on top of it, then Neo4j is becoming that graph layer. And that's built by exactly the same team who was initially building out that GDS product. And you're using a lot of that IP from GDS, right? So it ended up being like a good story, but it had a very kind of winding path to it. And, and that's, in essence, the message this morning, which is, it all, the market always changes. Technology continues to be at this breakneck speed. And you need to essentially, this idea of product market fit, okay, you do it once and then you just, that's all you do. It, and it's a constant battle. And not only that, but in the last 36 months, we got another extraordinary change that again fuels massive opportunities for Neo4j. But again, you got to go back to your drawing board as a founder and say, here we go again. So worth explaining what happened and how yeah. you're dealing with it at the moment. Yeah, so I think everyone's world changed, is it now two years ago-ish, ago. right? Like November of 2022, right, when ChatGPT got launched. And we had a sneak peek view into that because we, were, we did a lot of work with investigative journalism. We, we do a lot of work with investigative journalists. We're very proud of that. Like the Panama Papers, we were the back end behind the entire Panama Papers and you know, that kind of stuff. And as part of that work, GPT-2, that no one used in here, like it was not a mainstream thing, but it was actually very high on the list of journalists using it, or like fake journalists using it to generating news, fake news. Right? And so we were kind of tapped into that as part of our work with investigative journalists, right? But then ChatGPT happened, and that ushered, of course, into the, the era of Gen AI. And we now have these magical components, LLMs, that are creative, they speak English, they speak French, Canadian French, they speak French Canadian. They even speak Finnish, I hear, right? They're creative, they're generative, they're amazing, they're probabilistic, right? Magical in so many ways but they're bad at facts, they hallucinate, they're black boxes, they make up answers and can't really explain why they make up you can't those audit answers. Them. What's that? And you cannot audit them. And you can't audit them. You can't them. go back and say, here's exactly. why it's the proof. And it turns out that graph databases or knowledge graphs, a term coined at Google when you were at Google, yeah. which you, you yeah. remember, Knowledge graphs and LLMs is this match made in heaven, where we see this deep adoption, this deep wave right now of people, in particular big enterprises, saying, you know what? The killer use case for LLMs is giving the LLM access to my internal enterprise data, right? And putting that in knowledge graph form is the superior way of doing that. You do that in combination with what people call vector databases. And Neo4j today supports vector search in combination with, with graph. And if you do that, you get the facts of your internal organization. So that eliminates or at least reduces hallucinations. It's actually easier to build your application if you build it on top of graph databases compared to just vector databases. And it becomes explainable. You can explain why the LLM makes the decision that it does. All these things are very, very valuable, I think, across the board, but in particular, like big banks, like government, where you need that auditability and explainability. So that all happened in the last couple of, of years, right? But coming back then to product market fit, it's actually a new product, right? Because if you think about it, it is a new way of speaking about it, right? It's the value prop that I just articulated, accuracy, development speed, and explainability. 
those weren't, that wasn't part of our value prop five years ago, for example. But even on the other side, customers are, they hear everywhere, AI is changing my business, I need a plan for it. And at the same time, they're completely lost as to how to tackle it. So they okay. come to you and say, solve this for me, please. And you're solving it as you go again because you're building it on like live as we speak. Exactly. And that's then back to that initial product market fit thing where all of a sudden, okay, this places new requirements on the product, right? So the value prop is different. Core the same, but very different, right? The product needs to be different because now we need to be able to import unstructured yes. data. Like the world of LLMs is very much the word of text, large language models, right? So it's a lot of unstructured data, whereas we grew up in the world of structured data, right? And so that's back to that kind of product market fit thing. But now we need to do it at scale 200 million, right? So like one part of the company, which is probably, I don't know, 95% of the company, is out there with the classic neo 4 day use cases, selling into big banks, like big telcos, big pharma, all of that kind of stuff, right? But then we're putting together this small team of a combination of neo 4 day old timers and new timers. I'm deeply involved, kind of you can call it founder mode, but really in the, in the details and kind of building that out. And you get the benefits of distribution, which is what you have when you're a more grown up company. But you then need to marry that up with the fast iteration and innovation of the early days, right? And so that's a little bit kind of the conundrum in, in, in all this. But it's a, it's a very fascinating, fascinating opportunity. But the key message, like you take a step back from the last 15 minutes of conversation, the key message is you always have to stay a founder, whether you like it or not, because it changes so much. The beauty now is Neo4j is a well-established company with like super solid foundations. So, you know, 200 million of revenue is nothing to sneeze at, right? And, and the, the, the who's who of customers around the world. And on that basis, you now have a completely new, sorry for the pun, vector, but a graph um, of, of, of innovation ahead of you, which can, continues to propel the business. But it just requires this agility and this mindset of never stopping to look at the customer, never stopping customers, technology, trends, and looking ahead, and always, as we say in Canada, you got to skate to where the puck's going to be. Skate where the puck. Very Canadian of you. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. So you've been you've been around a block for a while, gray hair and all, right? Um, so how does this marry up with your experience between Twitter, Google, and all the other like things you've been in, involved with, right? So tell us a little bit about that. I think the, the easiest parallel for me is Google. People tend to, we're going to come back to Alta Vista, people tend to forget how much we were exactly in the same seat as you just mentioned over the last 15 years for yourself. Google started with seven text links. That's what you got on your screen. You forgot about that, but you go back to the original Google searches and you had seven links, text. And then one day somebody said, damn, you know what? When I type Mona Lisa, why do I get text? I should have a picture of the Mona Lisa at least. And, and then that led to, okay, it's not only about text, it's about knowledge. And then from there we said, it's not enough to have the Mona Lisa. When you type in Mona Lisa, you want to hear about the Renaissance and you want to hear about Michelangelo and the Da Vinci and the Medicis and and so that led us to again after five or six or seven years launch the graph database at Google and and now and then from there you know went on to the next chapter so even us when it looks at Google that it's very linear and easy it was a bit of a shit show I mean and it was a lot of where are these trends? What is obviously looking at you? What is technology enabled now and looking ahead? And again, skating to where the puck's going to be. So very much the parallel life. And that's why I can only but excited to hear your story today because it is all of the same genetics of what I've lived. And for the founders out there, it's, yeah, be ready to push hard on your product market fit, but remember to keep your 30% on the side because you need to invent tomorrow as well and 
you're going to get a curveball. You don't know when it's coming, but when it's there, you got to jump on it. I think we're out of time. Emil? Amazing, amazing last words. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your story this morning. Have a great slush, everyone. Thank you for taking Thanks, the time everyone. to listen to our Thank story. Thank you for paying attention. Thanks.